Amen. I'm excited because God is in the house. I'm excited that you're in the house, but I'm ex- more excited that Jesus is in the house. Amen. Let's pray, and we're just going to open up our service and invite the Holy Spirit to have His way today, because I believe God has a great plan for us today. So, Father, we just thank You that You are here in the midst of us. God, we get to be in Your presence today, and Father, I am so grateful for the plans that You have for us. I am so grateful Lord, that the Spirit of the Sovereign God has plans today to move in the midst of Your people. And I ask, Lord, that as we open our eyes and and we open our spiritual ears, Lord God, that You would help us to see and to hear clearly. Father God, I ask, Lord, that as we uh, start this service, Father, that You would cause all other things to fade into the background, Lord God, but that our, we would just be awakened to the presence of the living God in our lives and that you would move mountains here today in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. God is so good. We have a few things coming up um, in the bulletin. Um, lots of prayer requests. There's lots of, you know, COVID about in the Berlin Gorham area, and we need to pray that that would be broken. Um, there's, a, there's a list of people that are connected uh, to different families and stuff. Most of them don't necessarily attend here, but um, certainly pr- pray for Pastor Rob, who's still in the hospital and struggling. Um, buddy's sister, Kate. Uh, Karen and Jay's family. Um, Karen and Jay are fine, but their kids and their grandkids. Um, Larry's in here, but he's good. Um, uh, my dad and, and Kelly and also Kelly's parents um, are all struggling with it. Uh, Larry, um, Jared's oh, okay, my bad. Different Larry. Different Larry. Yeah. Okay, still pray for Larry. <laughs> yeah. um, just not this Larry. <laughs> you can pray for him too. Um, but certainly a lot, you know, a lot of people that we just need to cover in prayer. Um, so this, uh, weekend we have the women's retreat is coming right up and, uh, that's going to be awesome. That's the 16th, uh, I mean, uh, the 15th and the 16th. And, um, and if you're not signed up for that, um, then I guess you could talk to Beth and see if there's still room in any of the rooms. Um. I know we had a couple of last-minute dropouts, so there may be space if you're interested. Um, Also, we have a men's breakfast on October 16th, which is this next Saturday, um, and that is at 7.30 here at Riverside. Um, So please, uh, if you're a guy and you want to get connected, we want to see you there. We'd love to talk to you and get to know you, and it's a great time to fellowship Uh, And I think that is about it for announcements other than our normal youth group Thursday night um, prayer is uh, prayer is actually being changed to six o'clock on Tuesday um, by the request of those that attend regularly. Um, And uh, so that's going to be six to whenever we're done instead of five to whenever we're done um, starting this week. Um, Hopefully more people can come out that way. Um, and I think that is it. Yes. For the uh, Harvest and Berlin Prosperity Division, they have a prayer meeting at 1.30 at the beginning of this year. Today? Today. Today. Uh, so 1.30 is the prayer uh, for all those affected, especially Pastor Rob for them. And then at 2 o'clock, they have the men's meeting. Okay. That's going on today. And that's at, at the skate park? Okay, yeah, so there's okay at one thirty. People are meeting for prayer to pray over the community and those affected by COVID. So, uh, and that will be down at the skate park in Berlin. So you guys are welcome to join. Thank you for bringing that up. I did not. I was not aware of that. Um, all right. So at this time, we're going to take up our tithes and offerings. So if you want to stand, we're going to pray and. 
And I'll give you an opportunity to greet one another in the Lord. And uh, <sighs> Father, thank you that all that we have comes from you. And Father, there's nothing that we could give that could ever match what you've given us, what you've done for us. And so, Father God, I thank you that we can have grateful and generous hearts as we give. Father, we can give with a spirit of joy and cheer. And so, Father God, what we give today, Father, we, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would bless and that you would multiply to meet every need. We thank you for what, you're, what you have accomplished, for what you will accomplish. And, Father, we ask that you bless both the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Everybody said Amen. Amen. Greet one another in the Lord. Come and bring your tithes and offerings. Hey, Joe.
talked to her a little bit yesterday morning. Good morning, good morning, Riverside. Is everybody awake? <laughs> that's good. I'm not sure if I am, so that's good. The first song that we're going to sing is called Almighty, and it's an old, I think it's a pretty old song, but I don't feel so old because I know it, so I'm hoping you guys know it too, and I just wanted to share with you something. Um, I'm into, like, words and studying their meanings um, and exploring, like, their synonyms, you know, similar words. And I, I think it's important to understand, like, what we're saying and what we're singing, to really know and to really grasp what we're saying and singing to the Lord. So the, the uh, word almighty, it means having absolute power over all. So if we apply that with a capital A, almighty, Referring to Almighty God, that means He has absolute power over all. So just think about that for a minute. And then I'm going to share with you the synonyms for Almighty, the ones that relate to God. So the synonyms for Almighty are Author, Creator, and these all have capital letters. Author, Creator, Divinity, Eternal, Everlasting, Father, God. Godhead, Jehovah, King, Lord, Maker, Providence, Yahweh. So think about those words this morning. He is all those things and more to us. He is the Almighty God, the Most Holy, faithful through the ages.
that just it makes me think of God the Father. We are supposed to be like Mr. Beast in the sense that we are always watching. We're always looking. Oh, Jesus, you're going over there. I want to go with you. Jesus, you're saying it's time to go. I'm ready too. I want to go with you. God, when you call us, we want to be ready. We want our eyes to be looking at you, God, and not distracted. Our hearts not wavering from the truth, God. Set us free from our fears and our worries, God, our concerns. From this world, God, set us free from this world and the things that distract us, God, and may our eyes be watching for you. May our eyes be on your word. 
it's clear God wants to meet us here today. That's been the theme of my morning is just recognizing that God is, he's here, he's willing, he desires to move in your life to, to deal with the mountains and the, and the giants. And God has a plan. And I don't think it's a coincidence that you're here this morning. I think that I think if you're here this morning, uh, that this is a time for you to get close to the King. We want to be found ready when He comes. We want to be found looking the right way, not looking the wrong way, not distracted by the things of this world, not distracted by our problems or the giants or the, the mountains in our lives. And so as we, uh, as we finish up our, our time in music, and I just want to challenge you to come. Come, lay it at the altar, lay it at his feet, and meet with him. Jesus' name.
a shout of praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Messiah and King. Glory to God. We give you honor and praise this morning. We lift your name high above the earth, Lord God. High above the problems and situations that we see. Lord God, Father, we look into the heavenlies this morning. We see your throne of grace, Father God. And we ask, uh, Father, have mercy upon us, O oh God. Meet us in this place, Father God. Move mountains for us today, Lord God. We just thank you and we praise you for your vision. God, your purpose and your plan. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated if you can be. Um, give the teachers just a minute to get ready to grab the kids. and Because I know there's some kids that want to go downstairs, at least hope so. So, all right, I guess you are dismissed if you are ready. And uh, we're going to get into the Word this morning. We're going to... Um, we're going to be dealing with uh, scripture from 1 Samuel chapter 17 this morning, and uh, it's a classic tale of the little guy versus the big guy. We're going to be talking about David and Goliath, um, and and most of us we've been listening to this story all of our lives. We've heard this story probably a hundred times in some watered-down version uh, where nobody loses a head anyway uh, since we were probably this tall. And, um, and so we, we are, are, are looking at this really amazing story of a young man who nobody really thought much about until this day um, taking on a nine and a half foot tall giant, likely a survivor, a surviving relative of the Nephilim um, after the flood. And uh, we know the story, but I want to take a minute and kind of set the stage by reading, just in case there's somebody that's not familiar, um, that's watching online or is, uh, is here today. And... Um, you know, we know that, in, you know, in these first few verses in chapter 17, it tells us that these Philistines and the army of Israel are gathered in a valley. And the army of Israel is on one side and the army of the Philistines is on the other side. And in the middle is the valley of Elah. And um, this is one of the most beautiful farmlands in all the world. It's such a, a lush and, and beautiful valley. Um, and it's full of bountiful harvests and, and life. And um, at this time, the armies that are set up on the hillsides, they're looking down from the two hillsides into this valley, which would be farmland. And instead of seeing life and seeing vibrance and seeing the fruit of the land, what they're seeing is a valley of the shadow of death. This is, uh, this is a place where you go to die. And... Um, and so this is kind of a scary place. And uh, the battle lines are drawn. And we'll start reading in verse 4. And it says, And there came out of the camp of Philistine a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span, about nine and a half feet tall. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, or about 125 pounds. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed about 600 shekels of iron, about 15 pounds just for reference so that you know most bowling balls are about 10 to 12 pounds. So this is a big spearhead. Um, and his shield bearer went before him. Verse 8, he stood 
and shouted at the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And this went on day after day. And David, uh, who is not in the army, comes down to bring food to his brothers. And then in verse uh, 23, it says that he was talking to his brothers. And behold, the champion of the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. And in verse 24, it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fell, um, fled from him and were much afraid. David responds in in verse 26, he says to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now this got around and uh, verse 31 says, When the words of David that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight the Philistine. So I've been uh, reading this and doing a study um, from Louis Giglio called Goliath Must Fall. And I want to share some things uh, that I've gleaned from the study. And I tell you that I, I was reading this um, just so you don't think that I'm smart enough to come up with this. Um, I want you to understand the give credit where credit is due. Um, and I want to just share some things that I've gleaned from this series. Um, and I think it's really something that we need to hear now. This is something we really need to hear now. Uh, because there are clearly giants in the land. There are clearly things that are bigger than us um, around us. And I believe that the Spirit of the Lord wants to speak into our hearts and lives concerning finding our champion this morning. Finding our champion. And, and some of us, we're sitting here and, and you're thinking, man, I'm, I'm glad you're preaching on this. The person next to me really needs it. But I think if we are honest with ourselves as we look at this story and we think about where we're at, all of us here today would say, you know what, there is some sort of giant in my life that is ruling me, that is keeping me hiding on my hill, that is keeping me in a place where I am not useful for the king. And I want to challenge you today that today is the day that we find our champion. Today is the day that we find our champion. And so I want to just pray for a minute and ask God to meet us here in this moment. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are with us, that you go before us. You are our conquering king. And we thank you, Lord, that nothing that we can do is outside of you. Father God, it all comes from you. You are the source of our strength, our power. You are, uh, your spirit is, is so mighty in our lives. And Father, we don't give you enough credit. We ask God that you would be mighty today in the lives of everyone that hears this message today, God. Every person within the sound of my voice online or here today, God, that you would be mighty in Jesus' name. Amen. (laughs) 
when we start facing off against a giant, what better story to read than 1 Samuel chapter 17? Um, it's one of the greatest underdog stories in history, and it's used literally to talk about every little guy that goes up against a big guy for all time now for like 3,000 years. It's always David and Goliath. There's no other story. When we talk about the underdog, it's always David and Goliath. And this guy is big. He's strong. He's armored. Um, and he has Israel shaking in his boots. Uh, Israel being the army of Israel. And the giant is threatening Israel's feeding uh, freedom. And it is defying the God of Israel. And this is a story that is uh, really about a giant threatening God's people, threatening their freedom, and trying to steal God's glory from them. Why? Why would a giant do this? Well, it's simple. Because that's what giants do. Giants are only around to, um, to demoralize, to threaten, to steal, to discourage, and to break down our faith. And I'm here to tell you today that there are giants today that are doing the very same thing in the lives of God's people. And I want to pray today, and, 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 and I hope you'll pray with me today at the end of this, that, that God will meet you in the valley of prosperity and defeat the giant that is literally trying to steal your lunch. He's a bully, like in high school. And it's time to put him in his place. God is bigger than your giant. Today we're looking at things that are dead but still deadly. And um, how many of you have ever held a snake before? When you're everybody pretty much when you're a kid, you you go out and you turn over the wood piles and you find especially boys, I don't know why, but I used to love to catch me some snakes when I was a kid. And my friend, my friend, he had a, his dad had a python, and a big old python. I mean, I don't really know how big because I was this tall. And so in my mind, it's like nine feet tall, but it's probably only like four feet long, right? And, and so he had this python, and uh, we were not allowed to hold the python because every time someone that size holds on to a snake that big, especially a constricting snake, what does the snake try to do? It tries to wrap itself around your neck and choke you out. Now, it's super cool to hold a python, but if you're little, that python looks at you as lunch. <laughs> In fact, if you are laying down on the ground and a python comes and spreads itself out next to you, what it's doing is it's measuring you <laughs> to see whether or not it can fit you inside itself. Snakes are, they're kind of cool. I have always liked snakes. I've always enjoyed playing with snakes. Um, and, and I used to catch them all the time, but I'm a country boy from Maine. And in Maine, there's really no poisonous snakes. There's no big constricting snakes. And uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, seven, we went to South Dakota. And uh, in South Dakota, apparently there are snakes that will kill you. And I was out in the backyard of my aunt's house, and, and I caught a snake, and I brought it in. One of the biggest snakes I've ever caught, in fact. And, uh, man, I was proud of it. And I brought it inside, and my aunt screamed, and my mother <laughs> screamed. And they said, go outside, and you throw that snake as far as you can. And it was a poisonous snake. I don't know what kind of snake it was. 
The one I thought it was, I looked it up, it doesn't exist in, in uh, South Carolina, so it's not the one I thought it was. And I'm sure it's not as big as I thought it was in my, in, in my memories. You know how our memories kind of mess around with us. But what was interesting is as soon as I threw it, my uncle and my cousin, you know, they came out. One had a shotgun, the other one had a shovel. <laughs> and they had a plan. And, and I later figured out, you know, we went looking for this snake and we didn't find the snake. Snake lived. Don't nobody worry. But we went hunting for this deadly snake. And the plan was to shoot it, kill it, and then use the shovel to cut off its head and bury it or burn it. Because the venom in the snake's uh, fangs is still deadly long after it's dead. And today, we, we face a defeated enemy. Much like a snake with its head cut off. It is defeated. It has been demoralized. It has been killed. It has been destroyed. But if not properly taken care of, still very dangerous. We're in an interesting situation we're dealing with a conquered enemy that can still hurt us even though it's defeated and this is much like the reality that we face today Jesus has finished the work on the cross he's defeated the enemy he's cut off the head but we live in a time when it is yet to be thrown in the fire and so though it is uh, it, its reach is, is, is diminished. He's still deadly, though defeated. He's still dangerous. And we need to put him in his proper place. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. God has given us the power to resist him. God has done the work in defeating him. We just need to rest in Christ and submit ourselves to him, and he will set us free. He has set us free from the bonds of sin and the grave. These great giants face us all, the grave being the greatest of the giants that we'll ever face. And... As Christians, we don't have any fear of the grave, for we know that the grave has been conquered. Thomas Hobbes, a political philosopher and atheist, said on his deathbed, I say again, if I had the world at my disposal, I would give it all to live one day. I'm about to take a leap into the dark. Atheist Caesar Uh, Borga said this on his deathbed, while I live, I provided for everything but death, but now I must die, and I am unprepared to die. Thomas Paine, the uh, the leading atheistic writer in the American colonies, wrote uh, a book called The Age of Reason. He was recorded as saying this on his deathbed, stay with me for God's sake. I cannot bear to be left alone. O Lord, help me. O God, what have I done to suffer so much? What will become of me hereafter? I would give worlds if I had them that the age of reason had never been published. O Lord, help me. Christ, help me. No, don't leave me. Stay with me. Send me even a child to stay with me, for I am on the edge of hell here alone. If ever the devil had an agent... I have been that one. He said this laying in a comfortable bed surrounded by his family. The Apostle Paul, murderer of Christians, turned follower of Christ, recorded a different sentiment facing the same giant. He says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In another letter, he writes, When the perishable has been clothed with imperishable, when the mortal 
with immortality. Then the saying that is written will come to pass. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to the God who gives us victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the giant of sin, death, hell, and the grave, they have been vanquished for the believer. And we stand set free over these by simply professing the name of Jesus in our lives. But what of these other pesky giants that keep coming back into our lives? Things that are less eternal but chronic in our lives. Things that stick around while we're still breathing. Things like depression, rejection, addiction, fear, slothfulness, anxiousness, brokenness of all kinds. You know that God is greater and that the devil has been defeated. But we all still face different giants today. You see, like the snake, he's dead, but still deadly. He's on the prowl, even defeated. He is still looking for who he can take with him, even though he is destined to fail. Every giant does three things in our lives, and it's no different than in David's time. The giant lives to put us in bondage, to demoralize us, and to remove the glory of God from your life. Getting back to our story of David and Goliath, there's something that I found profound. And, and I hope this resonates with you. I hope that you guys can really get a hold of this. Every time I've read this story, Every time that I have read David and Goliath, every time I've heard it preached, there are some constants. We always make the same comparisons. You know, Goliath is the enemy, that, that giant in your life that's demoralizing you. And that, um, you know, God is God in this situation. And, and that I'm David. You're David in this situation. And, and I think what happens here, what's interesting about this scenario is, I, you know, you hear this story and you, you hear about the underdog and you relate to David, you relate to the, the, the idea that there's a giant, there's some obstacle in your life that you're having trouble overcoming, and you feel empowered to kill the giant, to, to take this giant head on. And when I read this story, I often think to myself, you know what, I need to be more like David. I need to be more courageous. I need to try harder. I need to do better. I need to be more like David. And and what dawned on me as I was reading and studying is, what if, well, okay, so I'm David and so I, I go and I fight the giant and it doesn't work. And so what happens is I end up compartmentalizing the giant. Right? And so I I say, okay, well, I can't quite kill you. You're frustrating. I'm not quite strong enough. I'm not quite big enough. I can't seem to muster it. So I'm going to compartmentalize this thing in my life and okay well you you win here but I'm going to praise God anyway because I've got the victory I'm going to let you have this little plot over here on the other side of the valley you can have that but I'm just going to ignore you compartmentalize you over here you stay over here that part's yours and I go on and I continue to fight the fight. I continue to have faith. I continue to walk with God. But there's this nagging giant. And there's 
Maybe another place in my life where the giant is stealing. He's stealing my joy because I haven't been able to defeat him. I haven't quite been able to muster whatever it takes to get him completely out of my life. So he steals this crop of joy or he steals this crop of peace or he steals this thing because there is a giant that I just can't seem to get over. But you know what? I love God anyway. I serve God anyway. And what ends up happening is I settle with this feeling and this thought in my head is, you know what? I guess I'm just not as good as David. I guess I'm just not as cool as David. I'm not as strong as he is. I, maybe I don't have that characteristic. And so I settle in my heart that I'll, I'll, I'll compromise and I'll, and I'll allow this giant to live in this, in, this, uh, in this part of my life, try to make peace with him. And in this part of my life, I, 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 he steals from me. It's kind of like paying taxes. It's a pain in my butt, but I get by. Nobody notices. But yet still there are giants that are having victory over me in my life. But what if for generations we've missed the point of this story? What if, what if I'm not David? What if I was never supposed to be David? What if David is not my role in this story? I want you to just wrap your head around this concept just for a minute. What if God is still God? Goliath is still the enemy. But who am I really in this story? I'll tell you who I think you are. You're part of the army of the living God. You are part of the army of the living God. Outsized, outmatched, trembling, hiding, Because you don't have the power to defeat the giants in your life. On your own, they're too big. Well, that then begs a different question. If God is God and Goliath is the enemy and I'm the army of the living God, who is it that comes in the name of the Lord to slay my giant? Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord maker of heaven and earth. My help is Jesus Christ. What if David in the story is not you? What if you are the army of Israel and Jesus is the only giant slayer in your life? You see, we want to be the conquering king in the story but God wants to be the conquering king in your life and so we go up against the giant time and time again and we fail maybe we have some victories and when we do we're the one that gets the glory and when we fall when we fail we're the one that gets the disgrace and, and so there's this idea that I want you to hold on to is that you need to stop trying to face off with your giants and start becoming part of the army of the living God who cheers on the champion, who cheers on the giant slayer in your life. Because God wants to slay the giants in your life. And He wants all the glory. God desires to move the mountain, but He wants the credit. I want you to get a hold of this picture. Jesus is in every story in the Old Testament. And in this one, Jesus is the chosen king that wants to kill the giant in your life. 
This story is a shadow of a greater story where Jesus defeats an enemy using an instrument not intended to kill giants. David used a sling. Jesus used a cross. But the result is the same. The enemy is defeated. The head has been removed from the snake. You were never supposed to be David in your story. You were never supposed to be David in your story. You were never meant to be the champion of your life. You were never meant to be more than a soldier in the army of the living God. Cheer on your champion, the king that destroys all that stands against the army of the living God. Can I tell you this is exciting? Because I have to tell you, in my life, battling giants is exhausting. And I'm tired. I'm tired of battling the giants. I don't know about you, but when depression knocks on my door, or when anxiety knocks on my door, I am tired of fighting that fight. But the army of the living God doesn't fight the fight. They cheer on their champion. They follow him into battle. And we, as God's people, we need to begin to see Jesus as the giant slayer. Jesus as the champion of our lives. It is so easy when we read this story to want to pick up the sword and, or our sling and go after the giant ourselves. It's so inspiring. But what we need is we need to submit ourselves to the champion of our life. Most of the time when we talk about the tough issues that we face in life, we think, I just have to be better. I have to try harder. I need to get after it. But in this series that we're going through over the next several weeks, I'm not going to be asking you to do better, try harder, or defeat your giant on your own. It will be about finding the champion of your life and letting him loose on the giants you've been facing. Saul says in verse 11, when Saul and the Israelites heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Listen to what Saul, uh, David says to Saul in verse 32. David says to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. I believe that when David heard the speech of the giant, his blood began to boil. And he looked at the eyes of the warriors that were around him shaking in their boots. And he sees this giant coming out. And and he sees that the goal of this giant is to take away any hope of victory. And David says, let no man's heart feel fear. Let no man's heart fail. Because of him, I will go and fight. 2,000 years ago, Jesus saw us standing before an accuser. And standing before God. And he realized that the fight was too big for us. He did not... We didn't have a case. We didn't have the ability to defend ourselves. So he chose the way of the cross. He chose the way of the cross to take away the penalty of our sin. To take away our brokenness. And to defeat the, the accuser. And he silenced the accuser with the nails and the stripes. Some think David's crazy. In fact, when you think about it, you got a little kid with a rock going up against a nine foot tall giant. It's pretty crazy. And and Saul even tells him, Go home, kid. Go home. Saul's head and shoulders above everybody else. He looks at this little kid and says, No way. Not you. 
I'm sure in Jesus' time when he stood before the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Romans, he didn't look like much. He probably, some thought he was crazy too. But David, he wouldn't be persuaded. He says, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there was a lion or a bear and they took lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. You can kind of feel the intensity here in David's voice. And I'm going to make a small comparison, and this is not to undermine what you should look at Jesus as. But if you really think about it, You've got this big king, this giant giant, and a little boy. And the little boy is standing before the king, and he must look kind of like Scrappy Doo. <laughs> Let me at him. Let me at him. Let me have him. I'll take him down for you. He, he really must. He must look like this. He's got this attitude about him that says, you know what? This uncircumcised Philistine, how dare he speak this way towards God's people? How dare he stand before God and defy his army? Oh, I'll take him out. This little scrappy do. And you know, when you stand with God, when you have a relationship with the king of kings, when you have a relationship with the giant slayer, you can stand with that sort of confidence in your life. I want to challenge you guys as we go through this series to really begin to look at your giants. Find them. Name them. Discover what they are. And then set the champion of your life loose. There's two things I want you to notice about David that you should be looking for when you're trying to find a champion in your life. David was not motivated by his own safety or his own freedom. In our culture, everything come back, comes back to self. It's about my problems, my diagnosis, my issues. In fact, most people look at the Bible as a self-help book. And i got to tell you, it's not. It does function in a way that improves your life and will give you the keys to move forward, to conquer your giants, if you will. And there's nothing wrong with basing your life on the words of this book. This is an amazing book. But this book was created to give glory to God. It's created to bring light to the giant slayer. Boy, I'm having all sorts of problems with this mic today. Excuse me. It's just driving me crazy. There, that's better. But in our culture, it does. It tends to be all about us. But David, he's not looking to keep himself free or safe. He's about two things here. And we need these two things as well. David is motivated by setting others free from the giants that threaten them. What's at stake here? Goliath says, send a man down, and if he fights me and wins, we'll serve you, and if I defeat him, you all will serve me. Giants live for the purpose of enslaving God's people. Jesus lives for the purpose of setting us free. Whatever giant you face in your life, you're not slave to it in Jesus' name. Depression, anxiety, fear, failure, addiction, pride, lust, pornography, falsehood, trauma, pain. 
they all must fall in Jesus' name. Him whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen? Resist the devil and he must free. Draw close to God and he'll draw near to you. David was not concerned for his own safety. He was only worried about two things. Freedom of others and he was also concerned with the fame of God. David was motivated by God's glory. He was motivated by bringing fame to God. Listen to Goliath's speech. In verse 10 it says, David, the, uh, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. In verse 45, David responds to the Philistine and he says, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I will strike you down. I will cut off your head. <clears throat> and I'll give your bodies to the host of, Philist of the host of Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth. That all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David wanted the world to know that Jehovah was still almighty. He wanted Israel to see that God could defeat a giant with a stone. He, his desire was to set the captives free, but to bring all the glory back to God. When Goliath stands before the army of Israel, he stands there and he demoralizes them. He stands over them. And everything that he represents represents the idea that your God is small. Look at me, I'm big. Your God is tiny and puny. What will he do against me? Who amongst you will stand against me? And this is the same thing that we face today when we face our giants. Everything looks big and blown out of proportion. Everything is larger then we can manage. But there's a champion that will stand in your place and fight the giant. We're here today because there's a champion in my life, a champion in your life. And we want to bring the glory of God to Him. We want to bring the glory of God to the champion of our life. We're going to pray and we're going to open up the altars in just a few minutes. I'm going to ask Amanda to come. And, um, and we are going to ask God to do a work. Because I don't know about you, but I'm tired of trying to face my own giants. I'm tired of, of trying to be the conqueror, the champion of my own life. And I want to challenge you today to lay that on the altar. I want to challenge you today as we sing and as we worship a little bit more. I'm going to open up the altars to surrender. Best battle plan ever. To surrender. It's not that we're giving up. And it's not that we're going to allow the giants to live in the land any longer. That's not the plan. That's not what surrender means here. What surrender means today is that I have found the champion of my life. And I am done fighting the fight. And I'm going to turn it over to you, God. I'm going to lay down my sword and my spear. and I'm not going to sit on my hillside and just watch the giants have dominion over half my valley. I'm not going to pay them their due to keep them appeased. 
I'm going to lay down my weapons and I'm going to stand and I'm going to cheer for my champion. And if you're here today, you got something so big, so strong, something you've been fighting a long time and you want to stop trying to champion it yourself, and these altars are open. They're here for you. We're going to pray. And we're going to pray for deliverance. If you've got a giant in your life that seems too big, he's kept you hiding on the hillside, daily comes out and taunts you, comes out to demoralize you, comes out to threaten your freedom. It's time to turn him over to your champion. So let's pray. And if you've got that giant, don't wait. Come down. Surrender yourself to the Lord. Surrender yourself to the giant slayer. God, as we stand here today, I'm done fighting my own giants, God. I'm I'm done dealing with this Goliath in, in my life, whatever its name is. And Father, I just ask, Father, that you, that you would be bigger in my story. Father, I've tried to champion it my own, on my own. And you know what? I'm just not as cool as David. I'm not as good as David, God. But you are much better. And so, Father, I lay down my weapons. I, I lay down the fight, God. And we just stand before you in awe of the great conqueror, in awe of the giant slayer. And Father, we cheer you on, Lord God, to take out this giant that I have no control over, God. This giant that, that, that has been demoralizing and, and, and causing fear and anxiety and brokenness. And God, we, we pray, Lord God, that these giants would be defeated, not by our might, not by our power, God, but by your Spirit. Father, Sovereign Lord, have your way in this valley. Have your way in this valley. Father, bring prosperity back to this valley. Father, no longer a valley of death. No longer a valley of fear. No longer a valley of anxiety. No, va- no longer a valley of brokenness. But God, a valley of victory. Lord God, Father, clear of all giants. We thank you that you are our conqueror, that it is not within my power, but within yours. And so, Father, we place our giants in your hands. And we say, Father, have your way. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. The altars are open. If you need to find a place to pray and surrender, We're going to keep this a holy place. If you want to talk, the lobby's available. There's coffee out there. Help yourself. But if you want to meet with the giant slayer today, the altars are open.